So, you know, a lot of people have misconceptions about what role emotions play in CBT, where they think CBT, we want to try to get rid of these negative emotions. We want to eliminate anxiety, eliminate sadness, depression, but we think of emotion as it should be proportionate to the situation. And then we want people to be willing to experience emotions. We talk about emotions in terms of something called the cognitive model, where the cognitive model is just that it's not our, there's not the situation directly that's going to lead to our emotional experience, but it's how we think about it. So we talk about, you have the situation, you have your interpretation or thoughts, and then you also have the emotional reaction as well as behavioral reaction as well. But in thinking of that, we don't think, okay, here's the emotion, this is problematic. We just think, does that emotion make sense given the situation? And when it doesn't make sense, so when emotion tends to be kind of more exaggerated or, or to the extreme, it's often because of the way we think about it. And the way I tend to go over the cognitive model with my clients is asking, you know, let's say you have a really close friend and you texted them five hours ago, you haven't heard back what would go through your mind. You know, they might say something like, well, you know, like something bad's happened. Okay. And if you think something bad happened, what are you going to feel? Okay. I probably feel pretty anxious. You know, and what might you do? I might just keep on texting until I hear back versus what could be another interpretation here? Well, they're busy or they don't have their phone on them. And if you thought they're busy or they just don't have their phone on them, what would you feel? Probably pretty neutral, nothing much in general. And then what might you do? Well, I just wait to hear back. So the idea here is we want the emotion to be proportionate to the situation. If you have this text, haven't heard back, if you don't know what's happened, you know, we want that emotion to be more neutral versus to be exaggerated. And like, I work a lot with anxiety disorder clients. And what I'll say there too, is, you know, we need anxiety, anxiety helps us perform and anxiety just means that there's a challenge when we feel anxious, it means we perceive a challenge. So anxiety is fine. The only problem is if you have problematic beliefs about the emotion, that particularly anxiety. Yeah, so for emotion regulation, the way we define it in CBT is really what are your beliefs about emotion and then how do you cope with emotion? So are, do you have beliefs about emotion that are reasonable, that aren't interfering with life and the way you cope with emotion when it shows up, is it effective, is it productive? So like I can think of um, a client who I just saw for a session, they have social anxiety disorder. So what they believe is one, anxiety is going to cause my mind to go blank. They also believe that if I feel anxious, other people can see how anxious I feel. So with these two beliefs, they then cope in really problematic ways. So one way they cope is just pure avoidance. Well, if I go in the situation, I know I'm going to feel anxious. That's going to cause my mind to go blank. People are going to think negatively of me and they're going to see how anxious I feel and judge me because of that. So when people avoid, you know, that's just, it doesn't allow them to see whether or not these beliefs are accurate or not, but it also leads to other problematic coping besides avoidance. Like that my client will just scan their body and they're scanning their body when they're in a social situation because they're trying to control the emotion. What I tell clients is, you know, the idea of CBT is not controlling emotion. It's just having a different relationship to it. Because I say, you know, if we could control emotion at will, so if, if I could say, if you could say, well, I don't want to feel anxious. Okay, I'm not going to feel anxious. You know, then we as therapists would be out of a job. So what I'm trying to do with this client is work on these beliefs. So one thing, one of the things I've done is I've done role plays during our telehealth sessions and I've recorded them. And then we play it back and I say, okay, let's predict how anxious you think you look. What do you think you're going to notice in terms of your symptoms? So your voice is going to be shaky. You're physically going to be shaking. And now let's watch it and see if they actually kind of concur. And what they found was that, hey, I actually don't look anywhere near as anxious as I feel. So there kind of gets at that belief. You know, the other 
belief in there. It's like anxiety is going to cause my mind to go blank. What I can do is help them develop a model of why this happens. So like right now, let's say if I was really anxious and I told myself, well, I have to control my anxiety or my mind's going to go blank to control anxiety. I need to then focus all my attention on it. But if I'm focused on the experience of anxiety, there's no mental space for any kind of words to show up or any thoughts to show up because you're too focused on the emotional experience. So what I have to do with this client is help them acknowledge emotion, accept emotion, stop trying to control it while they just focus on the conversation they need to have instead. So with this emotion regulation, it's let's figure out the beliefs about emotions in general, and then let's figure out how the client copes with it, teach them how to replace the maladaptive coping with some more adaptive coping. For this, I mean, you could say really most CBT strategies are emotion regulation strategies. Um, you know, I've kind of talked about a few where you're going to get at the beliefs about it and the coping, but like think of cognitive restructuring. You identify thoughts, you evaluate them, and then you develop a response to them. That's emotion regulation because let's say it's that testing example and you're saying, well, my friend must be in some type of grave danger, you're going to feel really anxious. Because again, the anxiety is telling you there's this really challenging, threatening situation. If you're able to stop, kind of take a look at what you're thinking and say, well, you know, this is a friend who can be flaky at times. They're not always good at responding. Like, I don't think that they're going to any kind of dangerous situation today. So, you know, this, this isn't a very likely probability. When you can respond to that thought and develop a new interpretation, that emotion is going to then be commensurate to it. So like, again, it's probably unlikely, like they're just flaky in general, it's going to be more neutral, maybe a little annoyance than they're in grave danger. So like cognitive restructuring is a way to do that. And with the cognitive restructuring piece too, what we can do is cut down unhelpful thought processes. So like, if you're someone, let's say, who's depressed, you tend to ruminate. Okay, I'm going to think about how terrible my life is. I'm going to think about all the things that I'm doing wrong and how I don't have what I want right now. So, you know, you can think of depression as you're missing something or you've lost something important. And the rumination, people do that to try to close that gap to figure out why their life's so terrible. But again, if you're in a situation, let's say you're watching TV, if you like what's on TV, your emotions should be fairly positive, but you're not focused on that. You're focused internally in your head, thinking about how terrible everything is. And because you're focused on that, your mood's going to go along with that. So through cognitive restructuring, you can kind of cut off that rumination process, which can allow mood to get a little bit more um, kind of commensurate to the situation. And then the other way is just like, some clients have really poor emotion regulation. And by that, I mean, they either engage in really impulsive behavior or potentially dangerous behavior like self-harm when emotion shows up just because it gets so overwhelming and they have a hard time tolerating it. For those clients, we can use either distraction or relaxation techniques. So, you know, if a client's getting really overwhelmed by emotion, what's going to happen? They're going to focus all their attention on it. If I can teach them, let's say, diaphragmatic breathing, where they focus on breathing in, they can count as they're breathing in to four, hold it as they breathe out, count to six, and then repeat that 20 times. What's it going to do? It's going to take that focus off of the emotion and what they're thinking about it, like, I hate this, I can't stand this, towards something that's more neutral, breathing and counting. And that can allow that emotion to get to a little bit more of a manageable level. But that's typically only with clients who like really have bad emotion regulation. Otherwise, we don't want them to try to reduce emotion or avoid it because that's just promoting the idea that you shouldn't feel this way. <laughs>